Hi everyone, good evening. So today we'll be discussing the second drug in our neuropharmacology series that is Riluzol. So this is the first approved drug for a very important and deadly neurodegenerative condition that is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And let's go into this drug. So first with regard to the mechanism of action, so Riluzol predominantly uh, exerts its action and efficacy in ALS by being an anti-glutamate agent. Okay? So it inhibits the glutamate related neuronal excitotoxicity. So glutamate is actually an excitatory neurotransmitter. It is an excitatory neurotransmitter and in excess it can cause excitotoxicity. And this anti-glutamate activity is both presynaptic as well as postsynaptic. So presynaptically it diminishes or decreases the glutamate release and postsynaptically it non-competitively non inhibits the glutamate in MDR receptors. And other mechanism, other minor mechanism actions are suppression of persistent sodium channel current by inhibiting the voltage gated calcium channels and production of neurotropic factor. So where do we use Rilisol? So Rilisol is only approved for one indication that is ALS, that is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron disease. It is the first drug that is approved for this indication. It's the first drug that is approved for this indication and it was done so in the year 1996. So initially it used to come in the brand name of Rilutec, but now it is a generic medication and is available as a generic formulation also. And Rilusol has also been tried, but however it is not approved for this indication for inherited ataxias, especially spinocerebellar ataxias. Okay, so there have been studies of Rilusol in inherited ataxias, especially spinocerebellar ataxias. But remember, it's not approved for this indication. It is only approved for one indication that is ALS. So coming to ALS, so as mentioned earlier, it is the first approved drug for this in the year 1996. But it's very important to give ALS patients who are going to start on the soul, you have to give them a realistic, uh, uh, realistic uh, uh, thing about the improvement. Okay, so they are not going to have any major symptomatic improvement. Okay, so the only benefit of Rilazol in ALS is the survival benefit. So patient is not going to have any sort of symptomatic improvement with regard to the weakness. And uh, it's very important to counsel the patients that Rilazol is not going to bring them back to normalcy. But however, it has survival benefit. And this survival benefit also is very subtle. It usually extends the life by around three to six months. And compared to placebo, it's only a three months, a three months survival advantage. And it also increases the, the survival rate for one year by nine percentage. And it also increases the time that is needed for the patient to go for a tracheostomy. Okay, so there is a delayed need for tracheostomy and the benefits of Rilazol is disproportionately more than bulbar onset ALS. Okay, so when comparing bulbar ALS with spinal ALS, bulbar onset ALS with spinal ALS, the benefits of Rilazol are disproportionately more for bulbar ALS. And we also have pro Rilazol, which is actually a pro drug. Okay, so pro Rilazol is actually a pro drug of Rilazol. It eventually gets converted to Rilazol. However, remember, pro Rilazol is not approved for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is actually currently under research for inherited ataxias. It is currently under research for inherited ataxias. And another point you should remember is another benefit of pro Rilazol is you need not give it twice daily. So actually, Rilazol is given as a twice daily dosing, but pro Rilazol being a pro drug only needs to be given as a once daily dosing. So to summarize, uh, it is the only it is the first approved drug for ALS. But remember, please give realistic expectations to the patients. Rilazol is not going to bring them back to normalcy. It does not cause any symptomatic, uh, major symptomatic benefit. It only has a survival benefit, and this also is very subtle, only about three months. And number two, it uh, it de delays the need for tracheostomy in ALS patients. And the benefits of uh, Rilazol in ALS is more in patients who are having bulbar onset ALS. Now coming to the dosing. So it comes in the form of 50 milligram tablets. It is an oral medication and the target dose is 50 milligrams twice daily. That is 50 milligrams daily. And however, uh, the timing of giving Rilazol is very important because high fat meals can impair the absorption of Rilazol. So either you have to ask the patient to take it in an empty stomach. If the drug is taken on an empty stomach, which is more than 60 minutes or more than an hour before food. However, if the patient has taken food, it should be taken more than two hours after food. Okay, so this timing with meals is very important because uh, high fat meals will impair the absor absorption of Rilazol. And because of the, uh, even though Rilazol is more or less well tolerated, it does have some minor gastrointestinal side effects like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So to increase the tolerability of this drug, uh, initially we can start 50 milligrams once dose, once a day, days, uh, once a day uh, dosage in the evening. And after one to two weeks, we can increase to the target dose that is 50 milligrams weekly. 
So we'll start 50 mg OD, which is given in the evening. Then after one to two weeks, we can make this 50 milligrams BD. Okay, the reason is because of the gastrointestinal side effects. So the, you can increase the tolerability of the medication if we follow this dosing schedule. Now coming with regards to the adverse drug reaction. So there aren't any major, uh, very major uh, limiting uh, adverse reactions, but do remember that the minor reactions are gastrointestinal in the form of nausea, diarrhea, as well as abdominal pain. And very, very important is elevation in liver enzymes. So it can cause transaminitis and this is seen in almost 50% of the patients after starting Rilosol. So it's important to get a baseline liver function test. And after this, we have to monitor LFTs once a month for three months. Then after the initial three months, it has to be monitored once in three months for the next one year. And after this, it is done periodically as needed. So please get a baseline NLFT, monitor monthly for the initial three months, and then once in three months for the next one year and periodically thereafter. And if the ALT is five times more than normal, you have to increase the frequency of LFT monitoring to weekly. And if the patient's ALT is more than 10 times of normal or the patient has a frank hepatitis, it's important that we stop the medication okay at that point of time the medication needs to be stopped and remember that the hepatitis and the transaminitis that is related to rilisol is very much reversible after stopping the medication and other rare side effects are dizziness weakness and tremor and also anorexia somnolescence and paresthesias and very rarely the patient can have hematological complications in the form of neutropenia this is rare it's only one in thousand patients so any patient or your ALS patients who are on rilisol and have developed fever please monitor the complete hemogram and there is also case reports of pulmonary toxicity which in the acute scenario can present with hypersensitivity pneumonitis and in the chronic scenario there have also been case reports of interstitial lung disease okay but just don't forget the gastrointestinal adverse drug reactions this is the most common one nausea vomiting and diarrhea and raised LFTs okay it's important you remove, remember these two these, are, these two are the most common adverse drug reactions now coming to the pharmacokinetics and interactions so just like rope in a row as we discussed yesterday it is a cytochrome p 1a2 metabolism predominantly n hydroxylation it has an oral bioavailability of 60 percentage and it is 96 percentage protein bound and it has a half-life of 12 hours hence the bd dosing and it is predominantly excreted in the urine 90 percentage and by the gastrointestinal tract by 5 percentage and slower metabolism is seen in two groups of patients okay so one is in anemic patients and for some reason the Japanese population also have a decreased or a slower metabolism or a slower clearance of this medication. And since it is metabolized by cytochrome P1A2, inhibitors can increase the drug levels of Rilisol. Can increase the drug levels of Rilisol, and these are fluoxamine, fluoroquinolones, verapamil, acyclovir, and amiodarone. So these can increase the Rilisol levels by inhibiting its metabolism. And inducers can reduce the drug levels of rilazole as well as its efficacy and as I keep emphasizing omeprazole commonly prescribed for no reason this can induce this enzyme and decrease the efficacy of rilazole and also in chronic smokers and rifampicin this enzyme can be induced decreasing the efficacy of rilazole and as I'm emphasizing again rilazole can cause reversible hepatotoxicity so please use with caution when you're using other hepatotoxic drugs concurrently now coming to dose adjustment so dose adjustments are only done in case of severe renal as well as severe hepatic impairment otherwise it is not needed and it is a pregnancy category C so unless there is a significant risk benefit ratio it need it should not be used in pregnancy. So that's about Rilazole and we'll meet in the next drug.